So the conference is about artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud technologies, et cetera. These are technologies that businesses are trying to use to modernize. Um, my topic today is about the process side more than about the technology side, right? Because businesses who want to modernize, who are seeking this elusive business agility, what they need to get right is the process every bit as much, in fact, more than the technology itself. So as Marcos mentioned in his glowing uh, introduction, thank you, Marcos, um, I've uh, been at Data Art since 2014. Um, I started my career uh, with a company called AW Systems, where we developed this approach we called the solution design approach, helping companies um, through these kinds of large transformation projects. We were acquired by Data Art in 2014 um, and started the solution design practice. I also teach a class in product management and technology transformations at Williams. When I talk, um, about what I do, I typically start with a st statistic that 40 to 60% of IT projects fail. Now, I used to have a slide that had uh, studies that sort of backed this up, but I, I no longer use it because when I talk to typically C-level people at the companies I deal with, the CTOs, CEOs, um, they all nod knowingly. This is not a secret. This is a truth. And it becomes especially difficult in modernization projects. These are especially difficult and risky and an even higher chance of failing. So when we say failing, what do we mean? Um, they're either over budget, behind schedule. They don't end up solving the right problem. They don't provide the business value that people were hoping for. They're not used. They're not flexible enough. And what's interesting to note is that more often than not, these aren't actually technical failures. It's not that the wrong features, um, that, that the features don't work, but rather process failures caused primarily by two things. Number one, that not enough time was spent upfront really understanding the entirety of the journey um, before starting on it, and that not all the stakeholders who need to be part of this journey were brought in early enough or at the right level of detail, and that they're not on the page, uh, same page about the approach. Um, and then just as importantly, not enough continued communication, collaboration, cooperation between the various stakeholders, and in particular, between business and IT. I would say that businesses who have legacy technology that they're trying to modernize, more often than not, they're gonna have legacy processes. Um, all right, I just got a note that you're not seeing my presentation. So much for me being, let me, apologies here. Thank you, Julia. All right, I fixed it on my screen, but not for you guys. Um, more often than not, hopefully we're seeing it now. Julia, can you let me know, are we good? All right, I'm gonna assume we're good. Uh, legacy technology will be supported by legacy processes. Great, thank you. Um, and with a legacy relationship between business and IT. Again, what people are looking for in these modernizations, the ultimate goal is business agility, right? They want to shorten the time it takes to go from somebody having an innovative idea, or feedback from a customer and getting that into production. And that is every bit as much, if not more, about the processes that you have in place in your organization and the relationship between business and IT. Um, so there are two key strategies to help you be successful in your transformation. The first one is spend enough time up front really making sure that you're considering the whole problem that it's in, in its entirety, that you're getting the shape right of the ultimate solution and how you're going to do there, and that you're going to bring your stakeholders along and onto the same page. That's the process that we call the solution design process. I'm going to take you through how we do that at, at DataArt. Just as importantly, for the entirety of the transformation, which really never really ends, focus as much energy and time and getting the process right, the how you do the implementation of the process. And that really is just product management, right? That is the intersection of business, technology, and design, and the processes by which you use as an organization. So I'm going to talk about both of those in turn. Let's start with solution design. So some key high-level thoughts. Again. I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Make sure you spend enough time upfront 
doing discovery and design involving all of the stakeholders, looking at the whole problem before you make any specific commitments about scope, timeline, et cetera. And involve the stakeholders, all of the stakeholders, and I should be clear, anyone who has to sort of say yes to the approach and anyone who can say no, make sure you involve them early and make sure you involve them regularly throughout this upfront process. Now, we typically do processes that take anywhere from four to 10 weeks upfront just to consider the whole. And by the end of that, we start to manage expectations of how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna approach it? And I'll get into the specifics of how we do that in just a little bit. The key is really to consider the whole. Go wide before you go deep. So go in successive, um, uh, paths where the image that I have in my mind sometime you may remember the progressive JPEG where the image loads and you see the whole image at low resolution make sure you imagine and, and investigate the whole problem and then go in iterative phases adding more detail as you go and make sure you're constantly focusing on the business objectives sometimes you have to reverse engineer requirements that you get right somebody says oh we need to replace you know this system understand why you're replacing it at the end of the day it can't just be about a technical convenience there has to be an underlying business objective that we're going to unlock as part of doing that and then make sure that you're working within your constraints from the beginning understand the constraints what is the budget that's that 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 is available to us to do this the time that's available to do this what are the regulatory constraints that we need to be sensitive to political constraints anything else that need needs to be the boundaries of our project, understand them from the beginning. And as you think about the whole, make sure you're constantly staying within those constraints. So in a nutshell, begin with an understanding of the objective, the scope, the constraints, and the assumptions. From the beginning, from day one, document the entirety of the transformation project before you dig into the details. This is the go wide before you go deep prioritize the biggest unknowns and the riskiest assumptions, right? So you do the first pass, you do the entire project, understand the overall shape of it. What are all the, we call it regions of the problems ahead of us that we have to solve and at least understand them all. Then do the next round of, of, of review. And as you're doing that, prioritize the biggest unknowns the, the riskiest assumptions. I always say solution design is not about hoping things won't blow up as part of your discovery process, but expecting that they will and hoping that if they're going to blow up, they blow up as early as possible in that process so that you have runway to course correct. And then continuously ensure that the evolving solution as you start to think about it fits the constraints, right? So if, if something unexpected comes up, a new requirement that you hadn't initially considered comes up and you start to solution something that might be bigger than what you initially assumed, see if it still fits. See if you can make it fit by maybe deprioritizing some things you earlier thought would be part of the transformation, et cetera. And if not, begin the conversation as early as possible with the community of stakeholders about, hey, maybe we need to reevaluate our constraints. Maybe the budget does need to be higher. Maybe we need more, more time than we initially thought thought, et cetera. Test assumptions early and often. This is the most critical. So even in the design phase, start putting together real prototypes and proofs of concept. So we use the word prototype to mean user experience, where we're going to show users interfaces that look like the real interfaces eventually. And proofs of concepts are technical tests. So let's take those in turn. If, if we're building a user experience, let's make sure the user is at the center of, of our design. And let's test ideas with them far before we build anything. So start prototyping, showing ideas, getting feedback, and using that feedback to inform your ideas early before any commitments and decisions about technology and approach have been made. Same thing with proofs of concept. If you're going to be you know, buying some tool for part of your solution or integrating with some API that exists, test those as early as possible because integrations in particular are always 10 times harder than you think they're going to be. And by testing them, if it works easily, great. You've removed that risk. If you bump into a problem, you want to bump into it as early as possible while, again, you still have runway to course correct. And then the goal by the end of this upfront solution design phase is to arrive at consensus on three key things. Number one, what is the point of arrival? What is this thing going to look like when we're done? Now, this is actually usually the relatively easy part. When we do these large transformations, usually we can get the stakeholders to align at a high level on, yeah, we're going to replace that system. We're going to deprecate that system. We're going to combine these two, et cetera. That usually is the easy part. The hard part is what do we do first? 
What's the first part of this new system that we can bring into production that is going to do two things? Number one is going to show value, unlock value as early as possible, but at the same time, start to create the foundation upon which the rest of the solution will evolve. And a key part for how you do that is a system for how the old and the new will coexist. These transformation projects, they take a year, two years, three years. You're not gonna build the new system alongside the old system and then from one day to the other transition to it. You're gonna build the new system piece by piece, taking piece by piece out of the old system. And you need to build a process. You need to invest in a system whereby the old and the new can coexist comfortably. So there's a technical aspect to that, right? With data flowing between the old and the new. And then there needs to be a user experience context where you build some um, scaffolding that allows the user to, in an ideal situation, not even really know when they're in the old system and when they're in the new system. Once you've invested in building that, then you can start to piece by piece take away the old system and replace it with a new system. So what I'm going to do now is take you through how we do that at DataArt. We call it the solution design framework. I'm going to, this is an example of, of, of a project we did recently. I'm going to go through it incredibly quickly. The point is just to give you an orientation of this, of this process. So um, we use a PowerPoint deck as the core deliverable that anchors the, um, the, the, the solution design process. We explain to the um, stakeholders who are part of this journey what we're trying to do, right? We're going to put together our understanding of the objectives, the scope, the constraints, and then the emerging solution as we start to develop it over these uh, you know, several weeks. Um, but the end goal, obviously, to come up with the optimal solution that fits within the constraints and then answering those three questions that I just outlined. So we probably the most typical is a seven week. Um, sometimes we do a little bit shorter, sometimes we do a little bit longer. This particular example uh, is, is showing where we got in gate one, which was um, three weeks into the, uh, into the project. Um, week one, we spend with the sort of core stakeholders focusing on the understanding of the objectives, the priorities, the scope, the assumptions, the constraints, what we're going to have at the end of this um, discovery phase together. And what's interesting is every time I've done one of these projects, we work with our core stakeholders, we understand what, what, what their view of the project is. Then we do this gate zero meeting where we meet with all of the stakeholders, right? We get them all together at the same time and we take them through, okay, this is the journey ahead of us. This is the understanding. And in almost every single one of these that I've done, we've discovered early on other ideas about the objectives, priorities, et cetera, which is great if you can get them out early. If you make the mistake of doing this whole process with just a subset of your stakeholders and you discover at the end you miss things, that's where failure starts to happen. And then we do um, these two week sprints basically, where we go wide before we go deep and we build out deliverables that describe the strategic vision. So this is the scope, this is the answer to those three core questions, the architecture technically, what are the tools we're gonna use? How are we gonna do this? The UX strategy, so in the first instance, how are we gonna do coexistence from a UX perspective? But overall, what's our design pattern? How are we gonna make this super useful uh, and usable? And then the project plan, which starts to evolve, which is at the end of this solution design, what is our high level roadmap, et cetera? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We describe the objectives. Now, what we do is we use the same deck for each um, uh, gate review with all of the stakeholders. And we use this convention where when something has changed, we'll either use red text, as you see here. So this is stuff that changed since the first gate, or we'll use a, um, a, a, a marker in the top left. I'll show you in a minute about new things. So here we talked about what technologies were going to be part of this modernization. As we did the work in the first three weeks, new things came up. Um, these were the, uh, the, the main priorities that we knew about at the beginning, but indeed by week three, we had a whole other page. And you see here the marker in the top left for how we show that it was new since the stakeholder saw it. This ability to show the entirety of our solution design plan in a deck that evolves is incredibly useful both to bring the stakeholders along in that process, but also because sometimes new stakeholders <laughs> come in, right? It's, it's very common for us to work on something, especially in a large enterprise, and we start to realize, oop, this is touching on that. We need to bring in that person. When you bring in a stakeholder, even if they're joining at gate two or three, they can still see sort of the totality of what has been agreed so far. Talk about the constraints early on. What is the overall budget and schedule that we're working within? Um, we talk about our assumptions, and as we confirm them, we, 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 we make that explicit. 
Um, then we start to develop what is the approach, right? So this was in at the week, week three, we started to form an idea and we show it visually. How are we gonna break, you know, on the right side, you see uh, legacy with this integration layer. What are the pieces that we're gonna build? In this particular case, we had two main, um, uh, we called them parts, but like, first we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this. And then we talk about, this is our view of the MVP. And again, this is in week three, and then we still are evolving the specifics of the idea and making sure that we're getting consensus as we go, not building all of this and then getting consensus. And then every gate review, we give an update on the deliverables in those four tracks. So the requirements is, is basically where we talk about the strategic vision. What are we going to do? What have we accomplished? What questions do we have? What blockers, if any, are there? What are we going to do next? Same thing on the architecture. Now, there are deliverables that we are working with, typically the people who are in the weeds with us. When we talk to the stakeholders, we talk at a much higher level about the key things, the key decisions, the key changes that have happened. Um, that they need to focus on. And we talk about what are we gonna do in the next uh, in the next two week, make sure everyone's aligned, not only with what we've done, but with what's ahead of us as well. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the second uh, chapter, product management, right? So the first chapter is about this upfront exercise where you look at the whole and you make sure you understand it in its entirety. And then the second chapter is about how do you then run this transformation, right? So while the solution design is responsible for coming up with this well-formed, well-supported sort of vision, the approach of what is our point of arrival? What are we gonna build first? What is the coexistence strategy? The product management piece is the process by which we're gonna make that become real, by which we're gonna navigate the sea of challenges that are going to present as we go through this process, right? continued stakeholder alignment, scope management, uh, clarity on the objectives which might change, change management, et cetera. All of these boil down to expectation management. Expectation management is critical. It's something that you need to focus on continuously. And so some key things to think about. First of all, embrace change. Don't, don't try to uh, ignore it or, or, or prevent it from happening. I always say that when we come up with a plan, communicate that this is a plan that will change, not a plan that we hope doesn't change. No, no, it will change. If you're doing a two-year transformation project, during that two years, there will be things that come up. There will be complexities that weren't accounted for. There will be edge cases and requirements that no one thought about early enough. There'll be wholly new requirements, right? There'll be new acquisitions. There'll be new clients, have new client needs, etc. All of this is going to happen and is going to change your plan. And, and instead of hoping that it won't, know that it will and create a mechanism that manages expectations around those changes. And, and to do it in a way, we call it sort of scientifically, right? In a way where you've modeled things with um, clarity and transparency in such a way that when things change, notice I'm saying when, not if, you can show the business, the stakeholders, okay, look, this new requirement came in, um, let's talk about where this fits in and let's show you how this changes the plan that we have so far, right? Like, let's show you how all of these pieces fit together, the, the, the dependencies between them, um, and empower the business to understand what to do about that change, right? To um, give them the tools necessary to see the whole, see how this new piece, whether it's a complexity that was unanticipated or a new requirement because of a, let's say, an acquisition or a divestiture or a new client who requires new things, et cetera, show them what that changes and then give them the tools to verify and, and, and validate their options. Don't ignore technical enablers and non-functional requirements. And it's not just that you don't ignore them, but that you explain and expose them to the business. Again, the business is ultimately responsible for uh, managing these priorities, and they can only do that effectively if they understand how all of the pieces fit together and how certain things that uh, may not be evident but are necessary for security, for robustness, resiliency, performance, et cetera, can't be ignored. And by exposing it and explaining it, you give them the appropriate tools to make the decisions. Um, 
This one is also critically important. In enterprises in particular, larger companies, they are uh, often very siloed. And uh, different uh, groups will be responsible for different parts of the program, et cetera. And often in one of these transformations, you need to cross those. And so it's really important that the team responsible for the transformation owns the dependency management. And that from the very, very beginning, you understand if there needs to be a change in this process, this process, this process, how is that dependency gonna be managed across the, the, the various uh, projects in that program? Okay, so what are the specific tools that we use? And again, just like I showed you with the solution design framework, I'm gonna give you some visibility into how we manage this at, at, at Data Art. So there's two parts of it. Number one is the backlogs. You'll notice I'm using the word backlogs and I'll explain why in a minute that's plural. And then the second is the roadmap. Let's take them in turn. So for the backlogs, what they do is they connect the vision with the process, right? This big idea, the overall, what are we gonna do? What are the parts of this? What, what are the known pieces of scope and how are we going to progress on this together as an organization? It's the, process that reflects both the decisions that have been made so far. So what do we know? What, what have we set up so far? And the reality of what is required to unlock it. So this is the dependencies um, for non-functional requirements, for technical enablers, how the pieces fit together. Um, but it's also um, uh, the, 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 the non-functional things, like I said, DevOps, QA automation, CICD, performance, security, all modeled together and how they connect. Um, and then we manage two separate backlogs, but connected in order to better serve the various stakeholders who need access to the information. And those are typically the business stakeholders and then the delivery teams responsible for executing. So we have one backlog that we call the requirements backlog that we use to model the problem space. So this is a set of prioritized problems to solve, right? These are uh, the, the to-do list, if you will, of the BAs and the designers. Um, these are the parts of the system that have to be designed. And then the second backlog is what we call the product backlog, which starts to model the solution space. So these are the specific features that are getting built in order to solve the problems defined in the requirement backlog. This is the delivery plan that's very well understood, modeled in detail with broken down to the story level with you know, instructions for what has to be done on the front end, the back end, et cetera. Having these two backlogs allows us to not block either of the teams when changes happen, right? Again, as I mentioned before, changes will happen, changes do happen. So by having two separate backlogs, where one which is looking at the problem space, where the BAs are looking at this and, and where the business is looking at the entirety of what we're trying to do, separate from the backlog that the, de the development team, um, the delivery team is using to actually chew through those requirements, when something disruptive happens, you can model it in the problem space without getting in the way of the teams that are building the, the, the specific software. And it allows you to manage um, two, two aspects that are important. So one is obviously the efficiency of the development team. So they're not getting pushed and pulled as, this, uh, 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 as these changes occur. And then the other is by looking at the entirety of the problem space. Again, we've started wide before we've gone deep and everything is well-defined and documented. Um, when changes happen, we have an opportunity to say, okay, this is a new piece of uh, functionality that wasn't originally accounted for and it's gonna fit here in priority. We can look at the entirety and we can remodel the complexity of maybe some of the other pieces. So we can still deliver the same sort of parts and maybe we do some of the parts that are in the future a little bit simpler than we had initially imagined. So there are ways to manage change without needing to um, uh, uh, change the overall uh, delivery timelines of the entire transformation project. Um, that's the providing the predictability in the face of business uncertainty. Um, again, complexities will happen, uh, unaccounted for edge cases, problems will happen. And by planning for them, and indeed, as you put together your overall plan, 
we, we always account for the what we call the known unknowns. By knowing there are things that you haven't accounted for and leaving room for them in the plan, when they happen, by having the problem space well-defined in, um, in, in, in a large, um, complete backlog of the entire problem space, uh, those changes you have an opportunity to um, model in such a way that, as I mentioned, don't, doesn't disrupt the overall shape of the of the project. And they most importantly provide a very clear mechanism to accommodate this change, communicate this change, and allow the business to um, basically decide how they're going to approach this. So visually, what does this look like? Um, so we have on the left side, you see the requirements backlog. We use JIRA a lot for, for, for most of our projects because it's what our clients tend to prefer. Um, and on the right side, you see the product roadmap. And we use a, a, a tool, uh, it's a JIRA plugin called Structure, um, which allows us to do some really interesting model. And I'll talk about in a little bit more what, what Structure unlocks for us. But what you see in the middle here is actually how the uh, product roadmap, the specific features that are described, maps into the requirements backlog. And by having these both separate and connected, when change happens, we have this very effective tool that we can take the business through. Okay, look, this is the change. This is the impact. Now let's look at our options. So what is the roadmap? The roadmap derives from the backlogs, right? Um, they model what could happen not what will happen. Again, every time we show the roadmap and we talk about it to the stakeholders, we're always very clear to say, this roadmap is a null hypothesis of a sensible plan given what we know now, okay? This plan will change, um, but it is a plan that is consistent, complete, and, and works, but it will change. And it demonstrates a specific uh, uh, beeline to value, right? How are we gonna unlock value when? And then by showing how it sits on top of the two backlogs, we're able to constantly reinforce that things don't really vary independently. So when you change something here, it's gonna have an impact here. And by using uh, JIRA and structure and modeling all of those, when we need to change it, we can demonstrate to the business what those changes mean and give them choices. So really we think of IT as the custodians of the backlogs and the roadmap and the business as the owners of it. And this allows us to turn challenges. So unexpected complexities, new requirements that come in from left field that start to, to push against our, our planned roadmap. Instead of those turning into fights and like, don't do this, you're ruining our plan, they're options, okay this is how we're gonna model this. We give the information necessary to the teams to, um, to, to, to make an informed decision about how to approach that change. Um, and then finally, this is a view of um, the, 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 the roadmap, right? And I wanna point out a couple of interesting things here. So we manage a release version um, using the JIRA fixed version concept, which is the current sort of null hypothesis of the roadmap. And then we have this separate concept called a target version. The target version is what allows us to model change in a way that's not gonna be disruptive to the delivery team. And we have the, the, the estimates, we break down the estimates into typically like what is required on front end, what is required on back end. That, that seems to be, that, 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 that's the team balance that we need to take into consideration. And by using structure, and the ability to build lots of different views and look at this, what it allows us to do is when there is a change, the um, product team can model all sorts of scenarios using all of our tooling um, and show it to the business, give them options, and do that in such a way that it does not affect the delivery team who sees this is the approved version, this is what I'm working on, et cetera. Thank you very much. I am very happy to take your questions. Uh, hello, Alan and everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful and inspiring speech. By the way, this is Julia, the moderator. And now it's time for questions. And we have uh, one in the chat. So please uh, ask questions in the chat uh, near the screen or with broadcast. We have a question from Lena. Alan, thank you a lot for SD in a nutshell. It's, uh, it, it seems SD should work awesome for bigger solutions and projects, but what you can suggest for a small startups? 
is there any option to go through all these steps uh, fast and effective? Um, so we actually use the same process. We sometimes call it something differently, even for a small project. Um, you know, we're not talking about tons of time for these solution designs, right? Like they're typically, the average is probably seven weeks. Um, but, you know, sometimes we do as short as four weeks. So when we do a smaller project, um, what we'll often do is begin with the solution design phase. Um, but really, it's important that you're answering all of the same questions. What are the objectives? What's the high level scope? What are we going to eventually do as this product matures? And what are what's required for an MVP to test our assumptions and get it into production as early as possible? What are the constraints, right? What's our budget? What's our schedule? What do we need to be sensitive to? And what are the assumptions that we've made here? It's really important, even in a smaller project, to consider the whole before you start building. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I, I feel like um, people sometimes miss is they think of Agile as this perfect solution where everything is going to be figured out as we go. And Agile is great from a development perspective, but it, it's not actually um, a, a magic solution to making sure that you know you're heading in the right direction. So uh, the, the process that I just showed you, of course, is critically important for a large you know, multi-year project, but I would argue it is every bit as important even for a project that you expect to complete within a month or two. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we have uh, eight more minutes to uh, ask, answer your questions. So please ask them if you have. Uh, that is uh, all, Alan. OK, well, if there are no questions, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to share some, some, some additional thoughts. So can you see? Yeah, so let's see here. Why is this not progressing? All right, here we are. So here's some 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 advice as you especially as you do these transformation projects. Avoid the sunk cost fallacy. Okay, so this is a a concept from economic theory where uh, humans really have a hard time avoiding um, if, if they spent a lot of money on something they're wedded to it. They think, oh, we spent you know a million dollars on this system and we have to keep using it, but it's it's really hard sometimes to recognize that if it's going to cost you you know a hundred thousand dollars to uh, do something on that million dollar system and it's going to cost you um, fifty thousand dollars to just scrap it <laughs> and start over that the million dollars is a sunk cost. Um, Avoid letting previous schedule estimates become hard constraints. So this is another one I've seen where you 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 early on think something, right? As I mentioned, change happens. And then that thing that you thought and you communicated now becomes a constraint artificially. So when you, by communicating consistently, this is a null hypothesis of a roadmap and constantly just reminding people the plans will change, you avoid this process where you start doing suboptimal things only because a month ago before you knew something you told somebody i'll have this done on this day um i touched on this earlier but very often we get requirements that are technical requirements i need a new crm i need a new you know and instead of being actually specifically a business objective make sure that you don't take as a requirement something technical that you always reverse engineer it into the specific business objective that they're hoping to unlock. Um, so if you can, as part of your solution, get something commercial off the shelf and not build it, for sure don't build it, okay? But if something off the shelf only does 90% of what you need, be super, super careful about how you'll provide the missing 10% before deciding to use it. By the way, Julia, you'll, you'll interrupt me if there are other questions, right? Um, uh, we and have then finally, uh, actually, the, uh, we have a, yeah, a, a small Lena, Lena uh, the author of the previous question, uh, saying thanks you uh, a lot and asks, uh, how big team do you have for uh, this seven weeks stream? 
Okay, so it depends a little bit on the, the project. Some projects are a little bit more um, UX heavy. Some projects are a little bit more technical heavy. Um, so we build a different team for, um, for, for different uh, use cases, but typically we'll have a solution consultant who is sort of the quarterback uh, lead of the project. We'll have a, um, a solution architect, so a technical person. We'll have a UX person, we'll have a business analyst, and we'll have a project manager. That's typically the core team. Based on the challenge we're solving, we'll very often have an AI, ML specialist, a cloud specialist, um, some specific uh, subject matter expert with a particular expertise. Thank you. And we've um, got the next question. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Irina is asking, can one project uh, backlog work for modeling both problem space and solution space goals? And what are the biggest cons of such approach? So the biggest con is that they typically are serving the needs of different stakeholders. And by combining them into one, you don't have the flexibility of having, I mean, think of it as basically one backlog as the to-do list of your BAs. And one backlog is the to-do list of you, the delivery team that is executing on well-formed, well-understood requirements. And so, of course, you can do it in one backlog. I think many companies do it in one backlog. But this is an innovation that we've that we've done that we have found has paid immense dividends, especially in a much more complex, larger project where you might be modeling a change. Um, you know, that you know is coming, but is six months or a year away before you even worry about it. And being able to do that in separate backlogs allows the two concerns to focus without interrupting and stepping on each other. Thank you. Uh, th that's uh, were the all questions for now for, for this moment. We have uh, four more minutes, so maybe you can continue with uh, some of your ideas, additional ideas. Yeah, sure. So I'll get back to this last bullet here for for the um, off the shelf. One of the things that we do very often uh, during a solution design is, you know, of course, if we can buy some piece of technology as part of the solution instead of build it, we will. Um, and one of the things we do is a gap analysis of the solutions out there. And like one of the, the most important things that I urge everyone to do is if you have a vendor, you know, and you ask them, can your system do this? Can your system do this? Can your system do this? They will always say yes. They will always say yes. And sometimes, yeah, with a little bit of customization, etc. Get them to build a POC demonstrating how it will do it um, and even pay them to do it because that is where you will actually see the complexity, right? Because the vendor during the sales process is gonna tell you it can do everything and it can do everything with a bunch of compromise and complexity. But if you get them to scope an effort to demonstrate to you that it works, and, and again, it's worth paying for, that's how you're gonna significantly de-risk the project, right? Because consider if you've made the contract with them and you discover halfway through that it's 10 times more difficult than they led you to believe, that is an incredibly difficult thing um, okay, another question. Another question, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Irina Singh, uh, and asking, how can steps on solution design timeline change in case the client uh, does not have clear vision for the project and requires more business uh, consulting activity? So let me make sure I understand the question. So how, if, if, if at the beginning of a project we sense the client really has no idea what they're trying to do, then how do we change the, um, yep. the, 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 the shape of the solution timeline. design? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yep. in the case where, so there are cases where we work with a client where they say, listen, we know we want to do something in this particular space, but we don't know how to do it or what to do. Then of course, it's very hard for us to estimate the effective size of the solution design. So in those cases, we do what we call a solution discovery. And a solution discovery is is a little bit more open-ended, right? Because I can't at the beginning give you a sense of, I think this particular problem is gonna take us seven weeks to get to the bottom of you know a solution that we can then start to build. All I can say is, okay, well, look, based on your problem, here are the experts that should spend some time on this. Let's get them working together and let's work iteratively for X number of weeks until we figure out either that we're gonna stop or that we've created the shape of the project. And the solution discovery then can morph into a solution design. And really the, the, the primary difference is that in the solution 
design, you have an overall shape of the project. You understand what you're trying to do and a solution discovery is much more open-ended. You don't even have a hypothesis of what the solution might, whether there is a solution and what it might look like. And therefore you just work a few weeks to see if you can come up with that shape. Okay, and that was the last question and we are out of time. So we are saying thank you, Alan, for this uh, brilliant presentation. And thank you all attendees uh, for your questions and for attending. So see you in several minutes uh, on the next presentation. Thank you, everyone.